Good afternoon, good evening, good morning, good day. Welcome to our Big Book 12-step workshop. Please join me in prayer for an open mind and an open heart. God, please set aside everything that I think I know about myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps in you, for an open mind and a new experience of myself, my brokenness, the 12 steps, and especially you. Please join me in the serenity prayer. <clears throat> Grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We're finally complete the rocket launch. To stay with that metaphor that I've been using quite a while now. Bill talks about it on page 25 in the big book, rocketed into the fourth dimension. That first stage is getting in the rocket ship and making a decision that it's all real. There is power and that power is available for a relationship. That's an amazing faith decision. We spent four months doing the work of the big book, looking at the need for help. And then at least a month, maybe more, that help was available. And then we spent about four months in that second stage of the rocket launch steps four through seven, identifying and removing the obstacles to that relationship. The relationship with the light that is deep down inside of us. We are not the light, but we are not not the light. The light is available to us deep down inside us. I use the word alignment as my commitment in step three and my effort in steps four through seven. And I end up at that end of that second stage praying my creator to implement that alignment. And then I move on to the final stage, the one that we've just completed eight and nine, the turning from our self-centeredness to other-centeredness in repairing the damage. Two aspects of repairing that damage, two aspects of amend. One, my decision to change and my effort to change using six and seven. And then my effort to repair the damage knowing that I can't change my history. There are some things that can never be repaired, but I can make an effort to repair it at the very least by expressing my regret, at the very most by taking some actual action, whatever that means in prayer and sponsored direction to balance the scales of justice. And I read the wonderful comparison, very insight comparison that Dan Sherman created in his book, <clears throat> Big Book Awakening, of the bedevilments, which is the spiritual malady in step one, with the promises at the end of step nine. What a great balance Bill gives us in the big book, whether or not he was conscious of that correlation as Dan laid it out and as I read it out and that it's in the way of life document, I don't know whether Bill was conscious of it, but it doesn't make any difference. I think there's many things in the big book that are incredible 
life-changing wisdom that Bill had no real consciousness of the depth and the power of them. I'm very convinced of that. And we can speculate on that all we want. All we need to do, though, is try to understand, observe it, and apply it. Doesn't matter where it's all come from, and it doesn't matter what the explanation is. It really doesn't. That's just bar talk. The point is that it works in such a magnificent way, powerful way, the most effective methodology for human change I've ever come across. And I've looked very broadly and experienced a variety and multitude of methods of human change. Certainly not all, absolutely. But this is the most effective I've ever encountered and experienced. Bill says on page 84, now we're transitioning from the rocket launch stage one, two, and three to being in orbit. Now that's the whole point of this journey is not to ride the rocket, it's to get into orbit around the light. I'm staying with the metaphor. Bill doesn't elaborate it with this level of detail, but I think it's helpful. Are these extravagant promises, page 84? We think not. They are being fulfilled among us sometimes quickly, sometimes slowly. Well, that's the difference between a spiritual experience and a spiritual exp uh, awakening, isn't it? We did that when we looked at Appendix 2, 567, 568 in the back of the book. It might be worthwhile for you to revisit that. It's not part of the suggestions. It's not part of the assignments but it always makes for a good meditation. These promises will always materialize if we work for them. Please pay attention. Please be a literalist and a fundamentalist with the big book. These promises will always materialize if we work for them. Oh, this is going to continue, it says. This thought brings us to step 10. This thought, work for them. The work is 10, 11, and 12, which suggests we continue to take personal inventory. Okay, step four is a moral inventory. Look at the words in the step itself. Moral inventory, not in contrast to immoral, as we looked at when we did step four. Moral, as in ethics, as in behavior, as in values, as in beliefs, as in motives, all the stuff that we looked at. Personal inventory now is step 10, in contrast to moral inventory. Step four is the super net that we cast to involve our entire being, thoughts, emotions, and feelings, the principles that are driving our lives, and the principles that we want to drive our lives. But step 10, that's a specific look with a microscope, literally. Not the big scope to look at the sky, but the little scope to look at the cell structure. Bill says it very wonderfully in step 10 in the 12 and 12. If you haven't read that or recently, please read it or reread it. It's phenomenal. It really is one of the best chapters in the 12 and 12 because it's so specific about how to use the step 10 tool. The big book is wonderful in terms of giving us the full formula. That's the only place that it is, is in the big book on page 84. But the 12 and 12 tells us how to use the formula. And there's lots of confusion and lots of um, ignorance, meaning not knowing. It says, it suggests we continue to take personal inventory and continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along, as we're living our life, as we're in our canoe navigating the river of life, we come to whitewater rapids. And we have to learn how to navigate that disruption. Disruption to the flow, keeping in terms of step three is an alignment and steps four through nine is to put us in alignment and we're going to regularly be out of alignment and therefore step 10 is the tool to be back in alignment. No, really, 
that really captures the entire essence of this navigation of life. I use step 10 in the same sentence as emotional sobriety. Homeostasis, a very fancy word that just means when I'm thirsty, I take a drink of water and I'm not thirsty any longer. When I'm hungry, I have a sandwich that I'm not hungry any longer. When I'm tired, I have some sleep. I'm not tired any longer. That's homeostasis in biologically, returning to balance. This is about emotional homeostasis. I get angry. I want to be calm. I get fearful. I want to be content and trusting. I have a reaction of hiding and camouflage and shame. This allows me to have healthy self-esteem. We continue to set right any new mistakes as we go along. We vigorously commence this way of living. Please pay attention to the words. This material is so dense. I'm going to unpack it word by word. A, a much deeper dive than I did when we did it at the beginning of this workshop. We vigorously commenced this way of living. Vigorously, a lot of energy, commenced, beginning, this way of living. Oh. Bill says uh, a little bit later here, we have entered the world of the spirit. We've had a rocket launch, steps one through nine, the program of recovery, but now we're into the program of living, 10, 11, and 12. No, that's the formal terms I use. Program of recovery versus the program of living. Addiction, the first half of the first step. Unmanageability, the second half of the first step. That's the contrast. The first nine steps deal with our addiction. 10, 11, and 12 deals with our unmanageability. We have entered the world of the spirit. Where, where have we been? Oh. If now we're just entering into the world of the spirit, oh, I've been in the world of self. Steps one through nine was all about me and my self-centeredness and how to turn. Step three, made a decision to turn. We vigorously commenced this way of living as we cleaned up the past. I'm a big book literalist. Oh. So when my sponsees finish understanding and completing their eighth step and then finish their understanding of the ninth step, their understanding of the ninth step, and I've said you're now prepared to go ahead and begin making amends, at that point I give them the 10 step instruction because it says we commence this way of living, 10, 11, and 12, as we clean up the past. My speculation is we need as much power as possible and 10 and 11 and 12, make sure that we have incremental power on a daily basis. We have entered the world of the spirit. Our next function is to grow in understanding and effectiveness. How wonderful is that? Confirmation of the model that I use. Understanding of my mind. Effectiveness of my will. I can now use my mind properly because I'm clear in its motives, its beliefs. And I can use my will because I know that my will on its own power is going to choose me and in alignment with God and in cooperation and companionship and hand in hand, as the fifth step says. I can navigate life with dignity, effectiveness. This is not an overnight matter. It should continue for our lifetime. Now he's going to get specifically into the 10th step tool. The 10th step is a tool very much like your cell phone. We keep it with us during our conscious time. Continue to watch. It's not paranoia, but it's vigilance. For selfishness, dishonesty, resentment, and fear. Did you ever see those before? 
Yeah, step four. The root of our problem, spiritual malady, first paragraph, page 62, selfishness, self-centeredness. And the fruit of the root, resentment, fear, and dishonesty. That's what we looked at. That's the model of step four in the big book. Notice the next sentence, please. When these crop up, Bill does not say if they crop up. We're human beings. We never transcend our humanity. In the 12 and 12, he just captures it. I hated it when I first heard it in my second year of recovery. Somebody quoted it in a meeting. I said, certainly that can't be true. Step 10 in the 12 and 12 says, it's a spiritual axiom. Whenever I'm disturbed, there's something wrong with me. Oh, no, they haven't met my father. Oh, no, they haven't met my wife. Oh, no, they haven't met my bosses. Well, I had not done a fourth step, so I was still a victim. Once I did a fourth step, of course, then I met myself. I'm the perpetrator, not the victim. When these crop up, it's a spiritual axiom. Whenever I'm disturbed, that's Bill's catchphrase. He doesn't use the instincts that he, we uh, looked at in step four. He uses this wonderful super net for our emotions. Whenever I'm disturbed, hmm. out of alignment, whenever I'm out of alignment, I need to be back in alignment because when I'm out of alignment, I'm going against the flow and I'm disturbed. Whenever I'm disturbed, that's why the, the uh, feelings are so important. I used to dismiss and, and relegate them to complete ineffective and inefficient experiences to be dominated and eliminated feelings. And now I know they're to be embraced as signals for survival. What brings me joy? I pursue. What brings me pain? I avoid. It's really that simple. Feelings are the signals. I've heard people talk about them as the barometer or the thermometer. I love those terms. They tell me the temperature. They tell me when I'm in alignment and when I'm out of alignment. He says, when these crop up, we ask. That's the first direction here. There's a four-part dance, the 10 step. We ask. That's a prayer, of course. Anytime Bill uses the term we ask, usually it's in reference to God. We're talking to God. This is a prayer. At once to remove them. Oh, so our first reaction after the pause, where we're aware that we're disturbed, the key to emotional sobriety is the pause. A one-second pause will give you a moment. A five-second pause will allow you serenity. The longer the pause, the more effective will be the reaction. With no pause, the reaction is unhealthy. With some pause, the response is healthy. The difference between a reaction and a response is the pause. We pause when agitated, he says at the end of the 12, uh, 11th step. We pause when agitated or confused. We ask God at once to remove them, at once. Pay attention to the words. We discuss them with someone immediately. So we pray because we're powerless, but we talk to somebody because we're human. This is a recap of steps one through nine. Step 10 is clearly a recap of steps one through nine. We pause and pray, steps two and three. We talk to somebody, step five. We discuss them with someone immediately. You see, the 
10 step is not a step that we do at night. There's lots of misunderstanding. I'm not here to argue. I'm here to interpret the big book and the 12 and 12. The 12 and 12 calls it a spot check inventory. Hmm, interesting use of the term. Take a look at step 10 in the 12 and 12. More than probably five times, it uses the term spot check. Oh, on the spot, when I'm disturbed, I pray so that I can be undisturbed. On the spot, when I'm disturbed, I talk to somebody to release the steam. We make amends quickly. I correct my behavior and I repair the damage if I can quickly, not at night, not in writing. I'm doing all this as part of a prayer meditation practice. During the day, on the spot, on the run. Then we resolutely turn our thoughts, number four, to someone we can help. Brilliant. Notice that Bill doesn't tell us to actually take action to help anybody. That might be interruptive to our day. I might be at work. I might be at a family gathering where I'm disturbed. And it would be inappropriate for me to go and leave my responsibilities to help somebody else outside of this milieu. So he says we resolutely turn our thoughts to helping somebody else with full psychological intuition that as we think, so we will behave eventually. But at least we're not thinking about ourselves now. We've turned away from thinking about ourselves and thinking about other people. Brilliant. Resolutely turned our thoughts to helping someone else. Love and tolerance of others is our code. He keeps it so simple. Our code from here on out, we're entered the world of the spirit, is love and tolerance. Ask yourself, is that one of your litmus tests of your operating principles? Love and tolerance. Probably need to know what those words mean. Look them up. And we have ceased fighting anything or anyone, even alcohol, even our addiction. We've ceased fighting. This is the promise of the 10th step. This is the spiritual awakening, which is the promise of the first nine steps. He says, sanity will have returned. He's not talking about psychological, psychiatric. We've looked at that word when we did the obsession work in step one. When we did especially the work in pages 35 to 37 on Jim, the car salesman that put a little whiskey in his milk. On page 37, Bill says, this is plain insanity. And then he defines it, a lack of perspective. So sanity is healthy thinking. Sanity is appropriate perspective. We will seldom be interested in our addiction. If tempted, we recoil from it as from a hot flame. In contrast to page 24, where he says, we put our hand on the hot stove, not remembering that it burned us last time. So my mental image here is we're in orbit around the light and we're protected by a spiritual shield. The obsession is neutralized. We're not vulnerable. These are not words in the big book. These are my words to express my experience and my understanding of step 10. Page 85. We will react sanely and normally. That's healthy thinking. We're not going to be hijacked by our obsession. We're not going to be hijacked by the thought. And we will find this happens automatically. We see that our new attitude toward our addiction has been given us without thought or effort on our part. Well, there's a combination of willingness and grace, isn't it? And a bit of an understatement by <laughs> a bit, a bit of an understatement. Without any thought or effort, you guys are the survivors. I mean, there's 78 people on this call right now. All right. We started with twice that. You're the survivors. You've been exposed to and done some work 
perhaps even finishing steps one through five, perhaps even finishing steps six through nine, or certainly have made progress in understanding and applying those steps in your life. You know you've put in a lot of time and a lot of effort. So when he says without any thought or effort on our part, it's kind of like, really? It just comes. That is the miracle of it. We are not fighting it, nor are we avoiding temptation. We feel as though we had been placed in a position of neutrality. That's abstinence. Not white knuckling, not holding your breath, not clenching your teeth, not making decisions on a daily basis or a moment to moment basis. No, not by the time you finish the ninth step. Breathing easily, canoeing on a very wonderful, calm, slow river life, safe and protected. We have not even sworn off. The problem has been removed. I'm just saying, this is what the big book says. This is, in fact, my experience, different than a lot of people's. Mine was removed before I ever came to AA. This is how we react so long as we keep in fit spiritual condition. Yellow flag is up. What the hell does he mean? The river is going to be calm as long as my spiritual condition is solid. This next paragraph is really dense. I'm going to take it word by word. It is easy to let up on the spiritual program of action. Okay. That's a synonym for steps 10, 11, and 12. A spiritual program of action to deal with unmanageability, the spiritual malady, to deal with reality, to deal with life. And rest on our laurels. What does Bill mean? Laurels. You hear it in the meetings from people who really don't know what they're talking about. They say, oh, they rest on their butts. No, that's not what it means. I mean, it does imply that, but that's not what it means. It's a rather classic reference to the Roman and Greek times that gave a laurel branch, a laurel wreath, to the Olympian winners. If you were ever able to go to Greece, it's one of the best trips I've ever had. And I visited where they did the marathons and the decathlons. And the guide was telling us about the stadium and the preparation of these athletes. And the winners were considered as close to God as human beings could be. The winners of the poetry, the winners of the drama, the winners of the prose, the winners of the art festivals, all got laurels. This is as close to human perfection. This is as close to human a God can be. Uh, humans can be to God. Now, that was the interpretation. I loved it. Oh, my God, does that fit in with what we're talking about? But to rest on our laurels is saying, well, I won the decathlon last year. Yeah, so what have you done for me this year, right? And you know people, well, I did the steps. Yeah, five years ago, I did the steps. Okay, how's your life now with your gritted teeth and your flaring nostrils? Mm, not so good, huh? Yeah, I know your wife's leaving you mm -hmm. or whatever else. Daily reprieve, he says. We are headed for trouble if we do. For alcohol, our addiction is a subtle foe. We are not cured of alcoholism. He doesn't say of alcohol. He doesn't say of our addiction. He's using here a synonym for unmanageability, I believe, for the spiritual malady. We're not cured of our humanity. Our will is defective. Permanently so. That's what he said on page 62. And only God can help us choose other than our addiction and other than ourself. That's what he says. We saw that in unmanageability. We saw that in the bedevilments. We saw that on pages 60 to 62. 
what we really have is a daily reprieve. I wonder if Bill meant that. Hmm. Daily reprieve. Hmm. What does that mean? Oh, like daily reprieve? Stay of execution? Reprieve. Look it up. Contingent on the maintenance of our spiritual condition. There he goes again, using that word he used up above. What does he mean by spiritual condition? Here it is. Every day is a day we must carry the vision of God's will into all of our activities. If we were all in a common room, I would ask the group, generally, as a broad question to the entire group, after I read that, whose will? And half the group will mutter, not too loudly because they're not totally secure, but they will mutter, oh, God's will. And I'll go, no, wrong. All right? Let's read it again in the context. Every day is a day we must carry the vision of God's will. Oh, my vision of God's will. That's what meditation is all about in the morning. What is my vision of God's will for me today? To be in alignment with reality. How can I best serve thee? That 12th step principle of helping. Thy will, not mine, be done. That action of our will, which is the proper use of the will, he says down below. These are thoughts which must go with us constantly. This is the proper use of the mind. What is my vision of reality? The flow. What is, and in common language to make it easier, most of us use the terms God's will. I'm going to release a series of articles on God over the next oh, probably couple of months. And one of them is, does God actually have will? See, I challenge that. Another reflection is, does God really have a plan? I, I challenge it with another reflection. These are like three-page meditations that took me a year to wordsmith and, and meditate and put in an order that I think will help people. Another reflection, when is God powerless? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I think they'll be helpful. They're not just academic, frivolous poetry for me. These are questions concerning our spiritual condition. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. Well, what line is that? Hmm. Well, if I wanted to go to London, I would go to New York and take a 747 from New York to London. How much of the time is the pilot actually manually flying that 747? About 10%. The other 90%, it's on automatic pilot because there's a device in the plane and there's a, a lot electronic device in London that are in correspondence with each other, which allows the plane to stay mechanically on, on course. But the plane is regularly off course. The wind shifts it, the rain shifts it, mechanical deviation shifted, but it always is doing course correction based on that electronic device connection between the plane and London. You see that device correction, that action correction, that's the 10th step. Whenever I'm disturbed, I'm out of alignment and I can become in alignment because the signals of emotions of resentment and fear and shame will tell me I'm out of alignment. And so I do a course correction on the spot with prayer because I'm powerless, with talk because I'm human, with amends because if I'm a disturbed, I'm sure as hell usually going to be disturbing you. And then I turn my thoughts to helping somebody else. And I do all of that in a minute and a half or two. I don't sit down to write it out. I don't wait till the evening to do that. I'm disturbed right now. If I'm spiritually fit, I will be aware of that and use the pause and the 
method of the 10 step. Now, I, I, I don't have no investment in anybody doing or not doing the 10 step at night and in writing. That's just up to you and your sponsor. It doesn't make any difference, but it's not the use. It's not the intended use of the 10 step from the big book and the 12 and 12. We can exercise our willpower along this line all we wish. It is the proper use of the will. So the two things that make us specifically human are our mind and our will. And Bill has just right here in this paragraph, very dense, has told us the proper use of our mind and the proper use of our will. The proper use of our mind is to be real. Yeah. What's reality? What's my vision? of my destiny and my purpose today? What's my motives? What's my beliefs? What are my actions? I, am I in alignment with my principles? Practice these principles in all our affairs. See, the principles are guide rails, guardrails perhaps for some of us. They're not laws or regulations. We can violate honesty. We can violate humility. We can violate with anger, but we always pay a price. When we violate, go in contrast to principles, principles will crush us. They create the tension in our life that we need to fall back position of addiction because we know addiction works. Our whatever is, alcohol works for me. It smooths me out immediately. Now, of course, it lasts for 10 minutes or 10 hours but it's not a lifetime. And then of course it boomerangs because it progressively deteriorates. In contrast to the spiritual practice of the 10th step, which progressively brings more light into my life and, and reduces the darkness in contrast to my addiction, which brings more darkness into my life and reduces the light. Short-term gain, but long-term pain, addiction. Versus short-term pain, recovery, 10 step for long-term gain. It's really, really that simple. Much has already been said about receiving strength, inspiration, and direction from God who has all knowledge and power. Is that your God? Do you need to revisit steps two and three and maybe upgrade, go to God 2.0 for you or 3.0? Is God all knowledge and power for you, whatever that means? Knowledge and power, image and likeness, mind and will. If we have carefully followed directions, not suggestions, by the way, we have begun to sense the flow of his spirit into us. There it is. Bill uses the term, the flow of the spirit. To some extent, we have become God conscious. The whole point of steps 10, 11, and 12 is to become conscious. Step 10 clears out the clouds. Step 11 fills us with light. Step 12 invites us to allow that light to shine out of our wounds, helping other people heal their wounds. You've heard the term wounded healer. It's perfect. That's who we are. Our liabilities become our assets. Our deficiencies become assets to help other people. We have begun to develop this vital sixth sense, that intuition, and an, an organic desire to help other people in some way. Not everybody is a sponsor. Not everybody is a step guide. But everybody is capable of helping somebody someplace in some way. But we must go further, and that means more action. We'll look at step 11 next week. So as part of the assignment for next week, yes, look at assignment 24. You've looked at it before at the beginning of our time, but I'm going to go over in a deep dive way the step 11 like I did with the <clears throat> step 10. And... Um, Look at the questions also that you were asked at the beginning of the step process.
those four questions that were part of the first two assignments, I believe. And then there were several questions, some formally, some informally asked. And you asked yourself if you followed the suggestions and the assignments and, and you wrote some things out. I'm interested for you to take a look at that so that you can use it as a litmus test. The process and my interpretation of it promises a spiritual awakening, which is a change. Have you changed? Have you changed in the way you think? Have you changed in the way you feel? Have you changed in the way you behave especially? What has been your experience over this journey? And also ask yourself a couple more questions. We'll, we'll be discussing all of this through the balance of this month and next month. Two questions. What's my commitment going forward? The, the, the workshop ends, but what's your commitment going forward? If you not finish your fourth step, are you going to make a commitment to finish it even though the workshop is over? If you have finished your fifth step, are you going to do your sixth and seventh step? If you finished your seventh step, are you going to do your eighth step? If you are working on your eighth step and or finished your eighth step, are you going to complete your ninth step? Is that your plan? What's your commitment? And then the second question is, that's the first question. What's your commitment? How are you going to stay accountable for that commitment? Do you have a sponsor, step guide, friend, partner? How are you going to stay accountable? Because you can make all the commitments you want, but if you don't connect to somebody for accountability on a weekly, monthly basis, you'll probably rest on your laurels. Really what I wanted to talk to you about tonight was to ask you to go a little further and kind of you know help us understand how you apply that to your walk. But you did such a good job in teaching it tonight. I'm just amazed at it. You know, you and I have talked many times about this, Herb, and I have, have you know, some long-term sobriety and, right. and I've I've loved my sobriety. It has been fantastic, but something was always missing. It was clear to me when I started this workshop with you, when you started out talking about the 10th and 11th step in the very beginning, that uh, even though I was actively working the 11th step, I had really missed the 10th step. I didn't, I didn't understand it. You know, Herb, it's one of those things. That it's not that I didn't want to do it. Right. It's I didn't want to read the 12 and 12 because I did all those things. I went to the meetings. I talked it with the people I sponsored, but boy, was I asleep to it. I just didn't understand it. And, you know, the way that you have led us through it has been such a new um, experience for me. And I was reading in your spiritual awakenings book today. And one of the reflection questions was, am I committed to a daily effort to grow in understanding and effectiveness? And, and yes, you know, I am committed. I see now, Herb, after all these years of sobriety, what I was always asking is what was missing. You have made these things so obvious in my walk today. And I'm so thankful for it. I prayed for a long time that God would put like a spiritual advisor in my life. And I would keep my eyes and I would keep my ears open going places, but it just, it, it didn't happen. And you just feel like the answer to that prayer, Herb. You, you have been such a blessing for me. And you know, because you've been a blessing to me, my entire family has been blessed. That's right, yes. Mm -hmm. And everyone that I know, the people that I hang around with during the day, whatever, it, it just grows. It's, it's so amazing. So I do want to thank you for that, Herb. Yeah, one of my teachers. Oh, you're so welcome. It's an honor to be here and to witness the transformation in each person, some of it's small, some of it's large. It doesn't make any difference. Everybody who has participated has experienced some shift in their consciousness. One of my teachers said, we either transform the darkness or we transmit it. Mm -hmm. This is perfect for the 10th step. And for the sixth and seventh step, Father mm -hmm. Richard Rohr. And he's the one that says, whatever we do any one place, we do every place. Mm -hmm. This is about being awake. Step 10 is about being awake. 
yes. um, when I'm disturbed. I'm, I'm not disturbed much anymore, all mm -hmm. right? But yeah. I remember going back, and I think I might have even shared that, that um, back in 2008, 2009, when the financial world was collapsing, um, I had just retired, and it scared the hell out of me. Um, uh, I mean, really emotionally and physically and et cetera, really, really, uh, for weeks. And um, I developed a resentment, which I wasn't aware that I had, and then I became aware of it. Um, and, and it was too large even for just a 10th step. Mm -hmm. I had to sit down and literally do a laser focus fourth step, column three, column four on it, uh, uh, for a couple of people that I was connected to at that time. And um, I, I got through it with that. But at the same time, and I think I might have shared this part, I was doing... Uh, a fifth step with a woman as an experiment to honor what Bill says you can do that with multiple people in, in the fifth step instructions. And so I, I experimented with that. Um, and at the end of a three hour fifth step, she said, Oh, you've been pretty sloppy in the last three years with your 10th step. Haven't you heard? Mm -hmm. I said, what do you mean? She says, well, we've just spent three hours. Are you telling me all the areas that you're disturbed about? Mm -hmm. How come it took so long for you to sit down with somebody? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Was that a wake up call? Oh, yeah. Yes. You know? I do know. <laughs> uh -huh. You know. <laughs> yeah. So um, I have two daughters that are 30 years each in the program. I probably call them more regularly than I call anybody else. Mm -hmm. I have a couple really good male friends. Um, I have a couple really good female friends. And every once in a while, I can call one of them or in a conversation, we can have something about some area where I've been disappointed or my expectations weren't met or my feelings were hurt or that kind of thing. Um, I don't have the same kind of active relationship with the sponsor that I used to have. Mm -hmm. um, and that's just what is right now. I'm always in meditation about that. Should I have a more active relationship with a more active sponsor? <laughs> and um, I've not been motivated yet to do that. Mm -hmm. I have a spiritual director that I talk to probably once every three months. Um, he's not in a program, but he's a deeply spiritual man. So I can more discuss anything than, than as a sounding board, than really, um, exercise any kind of a therapeutic relationship with. So I wear it kind of loosely, but I know that it's always there. The key is to pray about the disturbance and to talk to somebody about it. Those are the two. Praying is one thing, and it's pretty easy for me to do. I'm pretty disposed in that direction. Talking mm -hmm. to somebody else, boy, that takes some energy and some humility to kind of like, yep, still got the warts. Yeah. Yep, still a human being. It's very embarrassing, but there you go. Yeah, as I told you before, my my thing was I, I always knew when I did, did wrong. I mean, I would be convicted of it immediately. Yeah, but yeah try a little harder her because I, I really did have good intentions you know I I need to go to more meetings and read a few more books and doggone it, I'm not going to do that anymore but unfortunately as we both know you know these things do pop up because like you say it's a daily reprieve but you know Herb the way that you share your experience strength and hope and and you know obviously this outline this workshop the way you've taught it for years it is so fantastic for, you know, if you want to learn, I, you know, in business, I always said that people would say to me, will you mentor me? Will you mentor me in business? I'd always say, I would love to, but you have to want to be mentored to be mentored. <laughs> and that's kind of how I see this right here. You know, I, I can't get enough of it because I know the value of it. And uh, fortunately for me, a couple of the guys that I sponsor are also in the workshop and, uh, you know, doing the best they can with it, like I am. And then, I got a couple other guys who are going to try it in July this year. So we're going to hold each other accountable and keep working at it. I, I've kind of have think I, I'm thinking that 
becoming a step guide is a good move in order to be accountable as well because it keeps you active and plugged into it. It really keeps you fresh. That's, yes. that's right. And it's very, um, if you're an authentic person, which I know you are and, and all of us are striving to be, when you're talking to somebody and genuinely sharing some knowledge from the book or some experience of your own in terms of helping them, many times I'm going, you know, maybe I ought to try that. <laughs> it's kind of like, okay, yeah, that's right. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you again, Herb. Well, yeah. And what, uh, as I've been chatting with you, I'm doing some memory work here. One of the clear and from my standpoint, very powerful examples of perhaps a, a modeling step 10 was the dialogue that Heather and I had here publicly, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. where I believe I slipped off the rails there for a little bit. And then we took care of it out of sight. And then we brought it back to the group. I, I think that's a wonderful example of modeling the step 10 practice and, and process. You know, I do too, too, Herb. You know, I've thought about that numerous times since then. And um, that was just a powerful week because I think everyone was kind of in, involved and invested in that because we were all together. Yeah, right. And, you know, the way that uh, you, you did that and worked through it was, yeah, it was a really good lesson for sure. Yeah. <laughs> we don't need to revisit it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Herb. Thanks. Thanks very much. Sometimes, you know, the big book is, isn't very simple. It's very wordy and dense and, right. and it was, it's really helpful to hear it broken down very simplistically and, and concisely. Yeah. You know, to simplify it. Um, let's see. I am stuck on, uh, I have a couple questions for you about the eight step um, because I've done the steps before uh, thir fairly, you know, thoroughly out of the big book about 10 years ago. And I made amends to my two younger sisters. But after doing this, this four step, I, you know, I just there, I just got more clarity and yeah. like, I'm not sure if I should make amends to them again. I just feel like. Yeah, normally my recommendation is unless there's something gross in terms of an oversight that no, it's you're, you're, you're using their time to, uh, uh, bring peace to your own heart and and that's the reverse of what we want to do we right. want to if there's something that really is grossly unattended to yes but my suspicion is it's not and the the light touch that i love to recommend to people is one at a time your sisters is if you're in an informal situation, you're taking a walk, you're having a dinner, you're having a cup of coffee, you're on the phone in just a very comfortable way and say, you know, um, I've been recently looking at my life again and I'm very um, happy that we're back together and or whatever your words are in terms of our communication, reconciliation, whatever. Um, but is there anything in the last 10 years that, I've done to disrupt or minimize you and your life. And is there anything that you want to talk about? Some, some language, I, I was very awkward there. That wasn't smooth at all, but I, I'm pretty confident with some thought on your part that you could like just sort of kind of like a softball, kind of like open it up if there's anything that they might want to talk about that's been irritating them. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that, that's a, that's a good idea. Another ish dynamic of it is they've both been sort of in and out of recovery. Well, you know, that's uh, good and interesting, but it, 
it has nothing to do with your relationship with her and your your wanting to make sure that there's no shadow from her perspective th that you're unaware of that's all okay that yeah. that was a great suggestion okay yeah. the other the other eight step piece is i got into a conflict with uh, someone I've been friends with that I met in the program with but then we started having some business interactions and it became clear that politically we are very on different uh wavelengths right. and without without the story what's the harm done we no me not we okay, what's okay. the harm done that you did I reacted to a conflict very emotionally, sort oh. of like I did here. Like right. I think. All right. So a, well, right, I get it. What was the harm done to this person? Well, she apologized a few days later and, and I didn't apologize. And I'm wondering if I owe her an apology okay. because but but I don't know if that's my ego. Well, of course it is. Okay. <laughs> and, of okay. course, and of course, you know that. Yeah. You're just pretending. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. You're okay. protecting your ego even while we're talking. Yeah. Okay. But, but what you said is not the issue. What you said is your truth. The way you said it and whether or not it was appropriate to say it, that's the issue that, of course, created a controversy with her, I'm sounding like, and you said um, you got emotional or you had emotional reaction. So you right. already named it that it was inappropriate. So yeah. why, why would you hesitate and sort of, she's, a, she's apologized for whatever she apologized for. It seems to me that it would be appropriate and healthy for you to acknowledge that you overreacted, you're invested in your beliefs, and um, it was unhealthy of you, or whatever your words were. Again, I don't want to create your words for you, you're quite capable of creating your own words, but own your responsibility for your over, you said it, I overreacted. Right. Well, I, yeah, I guess here it is, and like, I don't, I don't want her to think she said some extremely racist things and yep. I try and I tried to and she brought these things up I didn't yeah and I but and, you don't have to be right and she doesn't have to be wrong okay. you you said it all you said you overreacted and therefore there was stress stress right. enough that created her apology for her reaction but you're not owning you're not owning your reaction you see okay because you feel you still feel right and you right. may you may be absolutely right in the content but you're probably not right in your reaction right i think i think i have as as we've all witnessed um lately trouble with conflict with people I care deeply or situations I care a lot about and yes and I um yeah I started crying and um couldn't really hold I wish I could have held a more use that as an opportunity for more constructive dialogue now, did you hear did you hear the words that you just used Man, that was perfect. I wished I'd used the opportunity for a more constructive dialogue. Oh my God, it doesn't get any better than that. Okay, thank you for helping me. Yeah. Like, get yeah. Yep. Because yep. I've been real confused about it. Yep. Yep. You can believe anything that you want. But if, in fact, your words and or emotions create stress in somebody else that's unnecessary, then it's up to you to sort of 
acknowledge it and try to smooth it out. Like she made her effort, but you haven't made yours, at least as you've related it to me. But you'll spend some time on it, talk to your sponsor about it. And boy, I really encourage you to embrace the words that you've already used. Okay. I mean, I have referred people to her for business and stuff. So in, you're in, new in, there. That's very nice. That's very nice. You're a nice person. <laughs> well, that, I'm saying it's kind of an indirect amends without no, like. Yeah, money. no, no. I don't believe in that. I don't believe in, I don't believe in living amends to dodge a real amends. Oh, I know. I'm not saying I, I, I'm not insinuating that I, I'm going to make it and I'd like to, you know, I'm just saying that um, I think she know. We I don't, don't, know, to, we don't need to pursue anymore. Yeah. You're a nice okay. person. I believe you're a nice person. You don't have to convince me. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> All right. Let's see. I have two things. One, I told you last week that I was going to talk to my, twins that I had found recently through the DNA stuff and I did speak to them on Sunday and it went extremely well we spoke for about a half an hour and uh, turns out one of them has been sober for 10 years um, and it was just a, you know it's it, it, it was very, very positive. There were no commitments, future, no uh, complaints about the past. Um, and it was just, it was really, really positive. So, um, and we will stay in touch. That's, you know, that's really big. And that, me being able to respond to that is directly part of, me being part of this group um, and doing, trying to do this work. Um, what I'm working on are my, um, you know, my defects don't disappear and I'm trying to change. I'm trying to change and trying to be aware enough of what my defects are you know, the procrastination, the spacing out, stuff like that. Um, not paying attention. That's, you know, that's just such a core issue for me. And the steps are the answer. I'm trying to, I'm working on my relationship with my higher power, where I've always had trouble with it being, I mean, I can talk and talk and talk to my higher power, but I've, and I've probably always done that. But being quiet and listening is not my strong suit. <laughs> well, I wonder if that's true in your personal relationships. Probably. Just I'm just speculating. Probably. Hmm. Good point. Good point. I'll make a note of it and... Um, Think about it. Well, you, you started off with one of my most favorite phrases. It comes from one of the, my best friends. He says, pay attention. That's his mantra. Pay attention. Very few words he uses. Pay attention. And that's how you started out. So now pay attention. Just You don't need to do anything except pay attention when you're with other people. Okay. Yeah. Will do. All right. Thank you. I just wanted to share, um, you know, because we're doing on the amends and step 10 this week. Um, I went home to see family that I had not seen in almost two years. And it was just a very challenging time. Um, my mom has memory loss that I had no idea how bad it was because I've been not able to see her and on the phone, she right. is you know, hearing and everyone's into denial. And I do this, I, this was my specialty area. I knew something was wrong, but just felt powerless to be able to do anything. And um, so even going, it was a 10 hour drive. And I have, I'm also, I'm in OA, but I'm also in what's called CPA, which is Chronic Pain and Illness Anonymous. 
And we use the 12 steps to heal the emotional part of having a chronic pain, you know, illness, which brings up so much grief and all those things. So it's been lovely to have the 12 steps for that as well. So I've really been, this program has just saved me and Zoom this year has been such a blessing. And this class every week has been such a blessing. But it was neat in that drive to be able to process in my mind of the person that I wanted to be when I showed up to be engaged with all these people that were, you know, the people that I've really gotten my most triggers with, I guess, in my life. And I've been doing so much work on just living amends. I've been in program for 30 years. I mean, I've done many step, lots of step work, but it's like the peeling the layers of the onion as time goes on, more is revealed, more of, um, I've done a lot of spiritual work outside of program as well. I was able to really use this program. And you always say that it's always about us. You know, it's never about the other people. Whenever I get triggered, it's always about me and letting go of um, expectations. You know, that whole thing about expectations or premeditated resentments. <laughs> I shared that with a few people and they just love that. And it really is so true. So I just am grateful that, you know, what you've reinforced this week um, about really owning what's mine. Yeah. And really the meaning that I give to things that I've got to change my perception and my expectations. So I was able to go to this family event and not to just stay in my loving heart. And that was my, my hope. I was asking higher power because my higher power for me, and I really love too how you've really emphasized that we find our own definition of higher power. And mine, I'm one of those prove it to me kind of people, you know, and in my work, because I'm a scientist, I'm a, you know, a sociologist, I've got a master's degree, I'm a nurse, I'm a psychotherapist. And something that I know to be true is that the energy of love that you show and we see in these rooms is the most powerful thing in this universe. And it is, is healing. And I know that when I'm in the zone, I mean, I sponsor people in both programs. And when I'm sponsoring, it's like I'm and I felt that way when I was a nurse and a therapist I was in the zone it was like where my heart meant to be and so it's like I wanted to be that person and my addiction was like my way I'm realizing that I have to have boundaries because I put out I put out put out and then I get a, a dry well yeah. and the way I filled my well because I didn't have a God in my life is I use food to nurture myself. And then, of course, I had to be perfect because I had to be, you know, the smart and thin and beautiful and blah, 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 blah. So, you know, I struggled with bulimia and all sorts of crazy things for years. And, you know, recovery for me, too. And something that I just want to thank you is a lot of the 12 step OA stuff that I have found these last couple of years has been this emphasis that if you're not abstinent, that you can't work the steps and that people say, call me back when you're abstinent and I'll sponsor you or I'll work the steps. Right. And I love that you say, no, 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 no. Cause I used to say, no, 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 no. Mm -hmm. I would be dead right now if yeah. somebody told me that. Cause for years, I never left. I kept coming. I mean, granted, there are years I was out in the middle of nowhere in the Air Force with, I mean, back in the day before cell phones or anything. But I always knew there was recovery in this program and I never quit. I always came back, but I was still practicing my disease for years and I could not get abstinent. But I, I healed from the inside out. You know, I started doing the steps and peeling the layers of the onion. And even now, and you shared on one of the, the second step teaching that you did, I think in whatever month that was, this woman was in OA and you're saying that OA, the food stuff is one of the hardest because it's shades of gray. There is no black and white. Every day I have an opportunity to screw up and not be perfect, whatever perfect is, you know, so really learning that am I here to be perfectly abstinent with food? Or am I here to be perfectly loving in how I live my life? And that's been the biggest gift for me is those days when I just get crazy with my food and my body. And I'm, you know, it's like, stop, 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 stop. That's what the old voices, what matters? What matters is that you're staying your loving heart, 
that you give service, that you be kind, and that you practice these principles in all my affairs. But anyways, I just um, thank you for all that you do and everybody showing up. And, I, you know, it was just really, I guess I just wanted to thank you for all the lessons that you've shown me that I was able to go home. And the one thing I just wanted to get some feedback from you, because I know that your wife and you were very close and she passed away. And I'm just grieving my mother, the person that I knew, and we worked so hard on our relationship. And we had this period that we were close and we felt like adults and friends in the last few years. I just feel like she's been slipping away yeah. and it's hard with long distance. You know, I've been away for so many years with the air force, but at least we could talk about things that mattered. And, and I'm just, when I saw her and spent this time, it's like, she's not there anymore. Yeah. And my stepfather is not helping. And he's, I mean, I, I keep trying to look at him with compassion He's been a bully my entire life. They remarried when I was 13 and I've really forgiven him. But I see now that he's almost keeping my mom from people because he, you know, is so protective and he's just not open to any kind of feedback on how to be helpful to her. Yeah. And I know that I have to let it go. I can't do anything, especially from this distance, yeah. but I'm just feeling this in my heart, in my gut just a sense of grief and I don't I'm, I just don't know how to move forward you know as far as just uh, and my whole family is detached and everybody's kind of like the elephants in the living room and their personalities are they just <laughs> ignore it and hope it'll go away wow. and so again I'm trying not to judge that but how do you deal with just this grief and I don't know. And, you know, and I'm wanting to eat and I know it's because I'm looking for that comfort, that nurturing, you know, this, this coronavirus year of isolation to being with people. I realized just how lonely I've been for connection. I mean, true connection. Yes. And um, with this illness that I have, my life has gotten smaller and it's been, there's so much grief and loss with chronic illness and mine is a progressive neuromuscular disease. And so it's like, how do you do grief without, I mean, I own it. I know that it's my feelings about it, my perceptions and my actions, but sometimes I just feel this heartache yeah. and I guess I, I'm trying to just allow it, not to fix it, not to try to analyze it, but I just love some feedback from you, how you dealt with just grief. <clears throat> It's a wonderful question. Thank you for your broad, inclusive recap of yourself and your journey and your circumstances and, and your witness to the power of this process. Um, that's why I'm so probably evangel and evangel evangelical about it because I hope in the best of senses, uh, because it's uh, it's so effective. Um, grief. <clears throat> I do believe that we have an advantage in having uh, a 12-step methodology and a community that we're involved in that supports us. <clears throat> I paid attention to my 10, 11, and 12 in a consistent, faithful way. I didn't do anything more special. I just made sure I was really paying attention to um, my fidelity to it, especially my 11th step. I was also very confident that I needed to communicate with people who really um, I could trust at the heart level, the core level, and those were my two daughters about their grief, helping them process it. Uh, they felt it more deeply actually than I did. My, I had been living with her in deterioration over at least a five year period. So I had sort of become accustomed to the deterioration, the disintegration. Um, and then I, I read the book that I had on my shelf for 30 years that I'd never read, the Grief Recovery Handbook. And if you 
might want to get that. Um, Grief Recovery Handbook is the name of it. It's written by a couple recovered guys, probably 50 years sober at this point. And I, I, I believe they're both still alive. And they have an organization called the Grief Recovery Institute. And they do trainings for grief recovery counselors. And so um, I knew both of them. I'd been involved with their weekends and that kind of thing, but I'd never done any grief work because I didn't have any grief that I was aware of until I uh, experienced the loss of my wife. Um, and then it was just time. It was time. I thought after the first six months, I was okay. Then after the next six months, I realized I wasn't. In that second six months, I could see that I still had stuff to process. And it was about two years right around the two year anniversary that I walked into my home and she had never lived here. I moved after she died. And um, I, I walked in and I, and I felt like it was, it was mine now. And I didn't have that sense that I'm missing something. So I felt like I, it had been processed in me. I almost said I had processed it, but that's not the truth. It had been processed in me. And, um, the, uh, the 10 step is just the miracle formula. Um, mm -hmm. So the, the key components of that are that we pray certainly with intention of healing and that we talk to somebody transparently about our feelings, not to wallow in them, but to acknowledge them and to embrace them really. And then eventually helping other people. I spend most of my conscious time on a daily basis focused on how can I be more effective in getting this message to people and getting some traction with them so that they can hear it. The biggest sadness that I experience regularly is people suffering and they won't or can't hear that a little bit of action would relieve that suffering. And, and I don't know why. Here you guys are. I mean, months into this thing. How come you pursue it with the effort and the dedication you do and other people turn their backs on it? It's not because we're special. It's not because we have any unique gifts. I really don't know the answer, but the, I'm in pursuit of the answer so that I can help people embrace this process and, and reduce their own suffering. So grief is just another form of loss or suffering and treat it just like anything else, quite frankly. However else you've dealt with your addiction and or your resentment and or your disturbance and or a loss, it's not any different than that. And the one thing I do know, and I'll end with that, is that it's a process. And I don't know whether it'll be a week, a month, a year, or a decade but it is a process. I, I suspect it'll be someplace between several months and maybe a couple of years. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that, Herb. I think um, that's the thing sometimes, just to not get emotionally, just feel really down and getting out of myself and helping other people always does make me feel better. I, I think that that is actually the key, not to lose yourself addictively in activity of helping other people, because we could go to the other extreme, but that, that in the final analysis is probably the most efficacious healing that you can do is in some balanced way. Uh, be very creative about how to help other people. And, and also a thought came to me, I've not done this, but I, I was exposed to hospice training at one point. I did a six month training in that kind of 
uh, care. And um, I know that there are lots of very experienced people in that area who in fact have written books and are uh, even courses in attending to people um, in their final weeks, months, years. And uh, so what you said just reminded me of that. There's a guy from Oregon who has an institute up there. I forget his name now. It's been decades since I've thought about it. But he has a program to help people help people. He's a train the trainer kind of person in the area of hospice. Mm, that's great. And one of the other thoughts I had when you were first talking was, and I don't know whether you're ready for this or not, but that is to write a letter to your mother saying goodbye. Hmm. At some point, you, you yeah. need to probably do that. Yeah. Yeah, thanks so much. I wanted to uh, talk about the deep resentments and um, I'm still praying for the ones that I started out with and I've sort of reduced it to just three. There's three that really bother me. So I said, those are the three I need to concentrate on. So um, as I've been praying about it, I realized there's sort of a theme because I just, you know, I can't figure, I can look at it and say, oh, I can see what's wrong here, but I can't stop reacting. And um, I just realized that the theme in all three of these is that I'm not getting the praise, recognition and approval I want. And I'm looking for validation outside of me from other people. So I said, okay. And I'd sort of seen that before. And then I went on to the last question, I think in that fourth column or the second to last, what's the payoff? I said, okay, why do I keep doing this? And I just, I realized that I don't believe that my higher power is going to give me this praise, recognition and approval. And if he does give it to me, how am I going to know? And when I realized that, I went, oh, okay. So now I understand what I think what you mean when you say I need a bigger God. <laughs> I need to incorporate that. God's going to give me that praise, recognition, and approval I need. And um, so well, that was. Or, 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 or maybe you are. Oh, okay. Maybe but that's going to be the only legitimate source is for you to say, you know what, I'm really okay. Oh yeah, I've got some flaws, but essentially I'm a pretty good person doing the best I can. You know, I'm okay as I am. Yeah. And what I did, um, one of the situations came up and I was able not to react. I just kept saying, okay, stay above it. Just stay with the higher power, don't react. I'm, and I kept saying to myself, I'm responsible for my behavior. And um, when I hung up the phone, I felt really good about myself. So I said, well, maybe that's how God makes me feel good. Yeah. So it was, it was just a really good insight, I thought. And then the other thing um, on step nine, I was talking to my therapist about this and she said, you're making yourself out to sound like some sort of criminal or something. And, um, you know, I told her about one of the amends I wanted to make. I'm trying to find this roommate from college. And she said, you know, if someone called me from college to tell me she wanted to make an amend for eating her oatmeal and not telling her about it and wanting to pay me $50, I'd think that person was crazy. Yeah, I, said, really? I, I, like, your, I like your therapist. <laughs> <laughs> and so she said, I thought amends were supposed to be like for big things. Yeah. And, uh, they, they, I yeah. agree. Well, it depends. Big is a relative term, but I do agree that uh, a bowl of oatmeal in college a few decades ago is not a big deal. Not worthy of you pestering another person. Yeah. Now, I did it every day, but, um, but then I just remember what you talk about, that I don't make amends because I feel guilty. I have to look That's at what's the harm. Yeah. And then also, like you just said, and don't pester these people because I sure wouldn't want people calling me. Yeah, yeah <laughs> well, wasting see, my and, and, and that's a wonderful way that she put it. Uh, how would I want uh, somebody to be calling me? Would I want them to be calling me on mosquitoes or 
large things. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So put yourself in somebody. Well, maybe that's not uh, uh, fair because you might not be able to put yourself in the place uh, and have a balanced view of it, but certainly discuss that with your sponsor and or your therapist. Uh, but I do agree with uh, her perspective on it. It sounds very healthy. I don't think that I've done a lot I, I, um, with step 10 in the past, um, but it's certainly made me much more aware of step 10 uh, going through this process uh, with you. And uh, one thing I wanted to mention was that I um, uh, was able to get the book uh, Breathing Underwater oh, as yeah. an audio, and I've listened to that. And I'm going to re-listen to it again. I've got so much out of that. And a couple of things that uh, just touched on me was um, we're talking about, um, um, you know, uh, making amends and um, saying I'm sorry. And, you know, he mentions, uh, you know, the Catholic Church started the tradition of, of going to confession and you're making, you know, you confess to doing something and the priest says, say 10 Hail Marys and you're off the hook and away you go. And, and so then I'm thinking, it's like saying, I'm sorry for whatever I'm doing. And then the next time I turn around, I do the same thing all over again. Yeah. So that really stuck in my mind. And um, the other thing that uh, he talked about was uh, just today at, at um, uh, the last uh, chapter was um, um, thought just went out of my head for a second, um, service, doing service. Um, I used to go to church every Sunday. I'd sit in my pew. I'd say thank you to our minister, and away I went. I never did any service in the church, and um, until I started in this program. And so now, you know, if somebody uh, needs some help in the church, you know, I, I volunteer. I do, you know, different uh, service things, just like at our my FA meetings. I do service there, becoming a sponsor, and. Um, and I know a couple of people, you know, uh, FA members, and they said, oh, you know, I, I don't sponsor because I don't think I can do that. And even though they've been in the program for a, over a year or two years or whatever. And, and so that just always brings back to mind is what service can I do? And, yeah. um, and, and making amends. Uh, I, I spoke, uh, my uh, sponsor has uh, done your program several times, so she's very aware of uh, doing the uh, steps and so I've given her my um, people that I think that I've harmed or know that I've harmed and how we're going to do uh, amends to them so I'm on track you know as far as uh, doing my work and, and I feel um, much more connected to the steps than I ever have been um, but if uh, I, I just wanted to really mention breathing underwater again you know it's yeah. had a big impact on me yeah, it's uh, Richard Rohr. Uh, he's the Franciscan priest I quote a lot. He's one of my teachers. And uh, that's his book on the 12 steps. Even though he's not in a 12-step program, he has uh, sat in meetings regularly because at his retreat center, he gave the 12-step people a room to meet in. And then he got permission from them to sit in the room because he said, these are the real deal. These people are really on a spiritual path. So, and from his experiences and his own personal connection with the spiritual path, he wrote that book. And so, yeah, good. And, and being able to relate to different um, biblical passages, you know, and it just it, it fully illustrates those steps. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Good, good. And so... Um, are you doing the steps, this journey uh, yourself? Yes, with my sponsor. Yeah, okay. And so... And uh, with you. Yeah, right. I'm right. a little behind. No, nope, you're not behind. All right? You're really not behind. You're at a different place, perhaps. But your path is your path. So I'm, I'm saying that for you, but everybody. Just honor the... The workshop has got its own rhythm but each one of you has your own timetable. Yeah. Thank you for that. Yeah, all right.
where I'm at. Um, yeah. I finished um, with my sponsor with step five. We ended up breaking it up into two sessions because um, they ran long. Mm -hmm. And this was the third time I did it and we weren't expecting it to run long. I said, oh, it won't run long. <laughs> and she's like, okay, it won't run long. It's the first time with her. And, but I was in denial because when I was, all the writing I was doing and all the resentments I was writing down, there was no way it could do anything but run long. Um, what I want to share with you uh, and, and anybody else who's listening, what I pulled out of this was, um, you know, I did a resentment on my father at my sponsor's request. And I did not, ex I didn't feel I had a resentment. Um, but what came out of that was a deep, without going through all the details, was I rarely learned through that process how I did not appreciate him as an individual and what he did to set a foundation for me to be where I am today. Yeah, yeah. And it was such a humbling moment. Um, there were other resentments, there were other humbling moments. That one touched me so much because I really I understood just how bratty I yeah. was as a child and yeah. how that carried into adolescence and how that manifested as an adult. Yeah. And I just wasn't even aware of it. You know, and thank, thank you, thank you God that my sponsor said, we'll do it anyway because you may find out something. Yes. And I just kind of did it because I was asked to do it. I wasn't really enthusiastic about it, but it probably was the most impactful. Um, where, we, where we're going from that is we have not done the six Step six, seven, and eight, but I've been moving along with the group doing some of those exercises, mentally preparing at some point to, to do the uh, amends, but I'm going to be working with my sponsor and, and, and step guide um, as we move forward, because I know we'll probably finish up before I get all that done, but I'm just going to continue to do that. It's, uh, yeah, just um, the, the key is to know what it is you want to do and commit to it and then talk to your step guide or sponsor or somebody about the plan and then to execute it. That's, I mean, and it might take a month and it might take several months, but be that as it may, if you're constantly chipping away at it, you will finish. Right, right. Yeah. And I, I did have one, one final question because um, uh, I've heard different things. So I'm just wondering what your thoughts are um, about retaking or reparticipating in as a listener in your net, maybe an upcoming workshop. Do you recommend a period of time in between? I know you had said earlier, at least I think I understood you say earlier, you wanted to leave room for other people to ask questions. So you didn't want active people like myself to be active immediately. Right. But do you have any other thoughts on that that you would share? <clears throat> well, sure. I have lots of thoughts and experience with it. And it's a wonderful question at this point in our journey, for everybody. Um, my own personal experience was I did the steps initially and then didn't do them again for another three years. And I did that with the interim of three years, three different times. Mm -hmm. And that seemed to work for me. My experience with, and I haven't done them since 2003. It seems that though a lot of people on the workshop have an experience where they finish up, maybe up through step five or through step six, seven, um, and then they are still working on eight and nine, or some people still working on step four, and they find staying in the workshop the following year or several years assists them in the continuity of continuing with the work at the same time they're listening to other people's experience in different parts of the work. So I think it's really between you and your sponsor. The one thing that is important is that you have continuity to finish the work. Once you're finished with the ninth step, you might want to take a break, I recommend it, and not do the steps again for a period of time, 
But again, I know people that do the steps once a year from one to 12 once a year. I could not do that. I, it would drive me nuts to, to be that, uh, how would you say, con consecutive with it. Um, but what, what will you do? What need you do? What can you do? Those are the questions and have a discussion in prayer, certainly, but with a sponsor uh, and then come to your own conclusions. But that's pretty, I'm not sure that's a, a specific an answer is necessary because it really allows everybody to kind of figure out their own way of doing it. The, the bottom line on all of that, I gave a lot of words. The bottom line is make sure that you finish the steps and then live in 10, 11, and 12 for a period of time. If you're ever invited to do the steps again by the Spirit, that's fine. Whether it's a year later or 20 years later, it doesn't make any difference as long as you're in a, a relationship of accountability. Okay. No, I, I, that makes sense for me. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That was broad enough to catch everybody. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Let's close with the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference.